Yes. Uh, so thanks to Brandon, uh, thanks to Incor and, and Ulster University and Healing Through Remembering, Kate, for, for hosting us here today. Uh, very generous of, of everyone. Uh, so as Brandon indicated, I'm going to be talking about resilience uh, specifically to conflict uh, and our, our efforts um, to think through how one might go about measuring that concept and why one might go about measuring that concept and why practically uh, for research purposes and other purposes, we've been focusing some attention on that recently. Uh, and when I say we, we uh, collaborators of mine, uh, research assistants of mine, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a sort of hot off the presses, as it were, uh, and fairly provisional. I mean, this is a, this is a foray into uh, trying to undertake uh, a form of measurement uh, I, I welcome the feedback, I welcome the, the insights that you may have, the thoughts you might have about uh, how well it resonates, uh, what makes sense, what doesn't, uh, what you feel is missing, and I'll, I'll acknowledge uh, along the way or, or at the end uh, some of the things that I think may be missing in what we've done thus far. So this is by no means a fait accompli of, of, of measuring resilience to conflict. Uh, it's an effort to, to undertake it because we think uh, it's a useful thing to do, as, as I will explain. So let me just talk a little bit about the inspirations to you know, how I come to be working on this particular topic, uh, this particular angle. Uh, part of it uh, builds off of the foundation of what Brandon was talking about earlier. Uh, I've been studying conflict, conflict-affected populations, conflict-affected settings for, I guess, 20-plus years here. Uh, so it's in that context, especially of doing uh, research on processes, research on uh, the phenomenon of conflict, uh, doing research uh, on individuals and communities that are affected by conflict, uh, trying to think through what those impacts look like um, and what it means, you know, terms like recovery and reconciliation, uh, transformation, uh, kind of how those unfold, whether those are, are uh, the right or the smart aspirations. So it's partly in that context. Uh, but more recently, uh, since I've been at CIDCM, which I uh, reduced down to the acronym, even though I've gotten quite proficient at saying the Center for International Development and Conflict Management uh, over and over again. Since I've been at CIDCM, just for the last essentially five years here, one of the things that I've been doing, one of the things that you know, pays my salary, frankly, uh, is working for the U.S. Agency for National Development, uh, in particular for one of their units um, that is uh, the office of, uh, that focuses on conflict management and mitigation. And they are the, the sort of primary shop within USAID that does especially quantitative empirical analyses for what they call a uh, they sort of lump under the umbrella of conflict early warning analytical products uh, because if you can create something that sounds very euphemistic in the U.S. government, more the better, right? So in that context, we uh, on an annual basis generate analyses for uh, CMM, as they call it, uh, that then get disseminated throughout the U.S. government and, you know, these days even up to the level of the the National Security Council, so at a relatively high level, where the, the sort of ostensible purpose is to develop, forecast, develop assessments of which countries are subject to conditions that we can describe as being you know, fragile conditions, uh, vulnerabilities or susceptibilities to societal upheaval or lacking potentially the capacity, the ability to respond uh, when instability arises, uh, and in turn, uh, also incorporating into that work uh, a set of products, or a, uh, that we've more recently evolved into a set of products that CIDCM has been doing now for upwards of a decade, which is forecasting instability risks. So, what is what are the chances that uh, countries will experience a number of different large-scale types of large-scale instability events. So adverse regime change, internal war, essentially civil war, uh, and also more recently we've started forecasting both state-based and non-state mass atrocities. 
So there's this context where there's an interest, there's a demand, there's a, you know, a, a major consumer, a major client in this case, effectively, for the contractual work we do, uh, of people that are interested in trying to develop assessments and forecasts of conditions within countries that relate to issues about susceptibility, vulnerability, risk, uh, the potential for upheaval. So that's one of the big contexts uh, <clears throat> for the work that I'm, I'm talking about today. Second piece is uh, uh, more recently, uh, over the last sort of two and a half years here, uh, we've had a grant funded by uh, a rather nice uh, uh, social science basic research focus initiative of the US Department of Defense, which aren't things that you would usually say in the same sentence, right? Uh, but they happened to, back in 2009, the then Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, decided that he wanted to push for having more basic social science research that would focus on issues that had some relevance for, uh, for national security concerns. And over the last number of years here as part of their call, one of the major topic areas has focused on resilience. Uh, we pursued and were fortunate enough to get funding uh, to undertake a project where the hook was asking questions about the extent to which development aid, foreign development aid, makes any contribution to resilience, and specifically resilience to conflict. And we were in particular focusing on resilience to internal armed conflict. Uh, so violent conflict, uh, again, of the sort of character of civil war. So we have this context of this large scale project where asking questions about resilience and then in turn trying to scout out and think about developing a way of understanding what that outcome is, how we might measure the outcome, is fairly central uh, to the project. Uh, at least if we are going to execute it kind of uh, true to the vision that we have of the project and really making resilience a thing rather than just a frame and then we just do something kind of broadly within that frame. Uh, so this is you know, partly about taking resilience seriously uh, and asking, well, what does it mean? How do we measure it? As Brandon noted uh, over the last uh, number of months in particular, uh, but uh, sort of essentially over the last year, we've been, ha have, have had this seed funding from our respective institutions uh, that we pursued uh, under the banner of what we were calling peace tracking, which is, you know, the essence of that is sort of asking questions about how do we go about tracking the evolution, the development, the progression of peace processes or post-conflict processes or transitions from conflict to something subsequent? Uh, how do we uh, understand uh, potentially what impacts uh, what happens in those contexts? And so we've been uh, working on that, workshopping ideas about you know, potential projects to pursue uh, within that vein and hopefully um, that will yield fruit uh, through this collaboration uh, across the pond, as, as I know we call, tend to call it. More recently, we've launched a new project um, in collaboration. So this is uh, some of us at the University of Maryland, uh, some folks in Switzerland, uh, an organization, Action Against Hunger, based out of New York, but with international offices. It's actually funded by the UK Department for International Development. So it's this modeling early risk indicators for acute malnutrition uh, project. And here again, this aspect, this notion of resilience comes into play, kind of asking questions about communities and populations and the extent to which or conditions under which they might be subject to uh, these sort of humanitarian crises related to food security. So with all of these projects, and with probably others that I could uh, put on the list, but these are sort of anchoring ones, sort of all roads lead to resilience or something in the vicinity of resilience, where you know, trying to think about what resilience means, uh, trying to think about how it could be described, portrayed, uh, how it could actually be measured, comes to the fore in the sort of work we, we're doing. So all roads lead to resilience. Uh, for the work that I've been doing recently. So just stepping back for those that uh, haven't spent time uh, in this literature, in this uh, sort of substantive space, uh, let me just give you the sort of quick thumbnail uh, history of resilience 
by all accounts, it's a term that can be sort of dated back uh, at least a century or more and sort of originally em emerging out of, uh, uh, of the engineering field and in particular uh, emerging out of describing uh, the properties of wood, of timber, uh, and whether, you know, the extent of force that you put on wood, whether it breaks or not, and resilience kind of characterizing that aspect of being able to withstand force uh, put against it. More recently, kind of dating back sort of 40 plus years here by now, uh, a lot of applications, a lot of discussion about resilience in the context of ecology and the environment, and in particular uh, related to, uh, often related to discussions about various forms of disasters, whether natural or man-made. And again, here thinking about uh, whether the, uh, you know, the, the physical system of the Earth or of a particular part of the Earth um, is vulnerable to suffering effects as a result of disasters or can in some way withstand and recover uh, from those threats. Uh, so similar, sort of an analogy, but the, the term has sort of increasingly been broadening or once you move into different domains out of things that may have very strict physical properties to them, uh, or have different uh, context to them, uh, the, the, the way that the, the concept works tends to evolve. Uh, around about the same time, resilience started cropping up um, quite conspicuously in the field of psychology. Here, more often, talking about it at an individual level, sometimes at a community level. In the more recent years, this, this term of resilience has been invoked um, in the sort of related fields of business, economics, uh, and more recently, development. So invoking the notion uh, that economies or systems of development can exhibit properties, can undergo uh, processes that mimic some of the discussion that we, one would have about a physical environment or about the properties uh, of an object. So if we're just trying to sketch out kind of what is and what is not or, you know, what demonstrates resilience as versus a lack of resilience, you tend to have a, a number of terms that can pop up on either side of that ledger. When you think about resilience, and again, going back all the way to the origins of it uh, in terms of physical objects, but, you know, extending through the, the other domains as well, notions around stability as exhibiting uh, or as, as exemplifying resilience, uh, the fact that the object, the system, the individual can survive. So, a, you know, a lack of survival in the face of some sort of uh, a stress or a shock uh, would not exhibit resilience. Notions of coping, notions of restoration, sort of recovery back to where one was or the object was before. And sometimes people even use the metaphor of, uh, you know, even something like an iron bar and a, you know, a fly that lands on the bar. That bar flexes just a little bit. It may not be observable to the naked eye, obviously, but then if the fly goes away, the bar just recovers back to uh, where it was before. There's also been increasing attention, as I'll highlight further, to the notion of resilience is not just mere recovery, but involves some sort of opportunity, some sort of potential uh, that could be leveraged for transformation. Uh, so not just going back to status quo that existed previously, but that some system, some objects, some individuals in the face of stresses and shocks may actually exhibit a certain potential for transformation that we would characterize as sort of augmenting the extent of resilience uh, uh, that we would characterize. And again, kind of on the other side of the ledger, we can kind of think about the, the synonyms or, or things that would uh, characterize a lack of resilience. So one of the classic things that people have typically done uh, in the field, and you see a, a variation of this graphic uh, appear quite often is the notion that you can sort of chart out what resilience looks like visually. At least a sort of stylized visualization of, of what resilience would look like. 
And so the basic notion of resilience then is that there is some sort of set of ongoing stressors or stresses and or a shock that occurs. And the question is, well, in part, whether or not, again, whatever one is talking about vis-a-vis -vis resilience is potentially more or less subject to those stresses and shocks. Whether or not, in fact, an exposure occurs to those stresses and shocks. If so, how severe are the consequences? What happens? What ensues? How long is that effect experienced? Is there some sort of full recovery back to a state uh, that existed previously, whatever that baseline might be characterized as? Is there the subsequent stage of transformation that occurs? And you know, we can also think about whether or not this whole process involves potential for recurrence of the phenomenon. Potentially what the system, what the object, what the subject of resilience goes through may be weakened over the course of experiencing the impact of these shocks and stresses that have some sort of effect uh, on it. Uh, so this is, tends to be sort of the classic way that that resilience gets mapped out. And I'm going to return back to this graphic when thinking through the logic of, of resilience to conflict. So part of what then became sort of an animating feature of, of the, the grant proposal we pursued around this uh, aiding resilience project, this aid and conflict project, was asking questions about aid, uh, you know, recognizing that development actors, donors, uh, the various professionals that work for the donors, uh, practitioners in the field, had started invoking this concept in the particular context of development, development work around the world. And USAID in particular, a handful of years ago, had sketched out a definition which maps on to many of the sort of classic definitions of resilience, especially those that move beyond the sort of more narrow confines of the engineering world. And so they describe resilience, they define resilience as the ability of people, households, communities, countries, and systems. So really sort of spanning the gamut uh, of different types of levels of analysis and actors uh, that are sort of within their purview uh, in terms of what uh, activities they engage in. So, and I realize I've kind of formatted it in a way that looks odd, but I want to kind of parse the elements that, to this definition that are, are consequential. So, the ability of these different sorts of actors, so the, the notion is uh, you can evaluate it for any of these potentially separately or collectively in some way, to mitigate, adapt to, and recover from. So the mitigation is, is sort of maps onto that notion of to what extent is an effect experienced and kind of how deep or significant, how substantial, how enduring is that effect. Adapt to, which is, is there a reaction? Is there a response? Is there something done to try and combat the situation which might involve changing practices, changing relationships, uh, et cetera? And recovery from, so we ta I talked earlier about what recovery would involve. They invoke this notion of shocks and stresses. So you know, we can think of, of a wide variety of shocks and stresses that would be relevant for uh, the development domain. In a manner, and here is where the USAID definition really kind of takes that pretty ambitious step forward in terms of the expectations, or at least as part of what the expectations of resilience could be in a manner that reduces chronic vulnerability, right? So this is partly focused on that question of whether recurrence is part of the equation. So it, it's mattering to USAID not just whether or not you can sort of restore things back to the status quo, but whether or not you can do so in a way that uh, avoids or tries to limit the extent to which this becomes a recurring problem, sort of you know, the sort of traps, the development traps or underdevelopment traps that can occur, and facilitates inclusive growth. So here's another area where USAID kind of goes a bit further than, than most would, where they're really giving a nod to issues around equity, right? Equity and justice. 
part of what's probably implicit in that is a notion that if you make forays on that front, that may contribute to a lessening of the sorts of vulnerabilities that exist. So a lot of discussion out there uh, in the development world uh, talking about um, uh, inequality that exists, especially e economic inequality, wealth inequality that exists. So this is partly a nod to that uh, sort of philosophy. So, so stepping back from this for a moment, now that we have on, our on the table some sense of what we're talking about here, so why should we care about resilience? So I'm going to talk about this, and then I'm going to step to the other side of the ledger and talk about what Brandon makes, made reference to, uh, perhaps the more cynical views or critical views or hesitation around resilience. So in principle, the case for caring about resilience uh, studying resilience, measuring resilience, invoking resilience as part of work, as part of analysis. In principle, this is about giving insight about risk profiles, capabilities that exist, the consequences that might be observed given different profiles and capabilities, what sort of needs might exist. If you, ex you know, Im implicitly, if certain settings, and we're talking about development settings, if certain settings e exhibit however one conceives and measures of it, uh, a, exhibit less resilience, that may be something that one could remediate and remediate in a way that's proactive. So the proactive part then gets us to, well, you know, it sort of sets a, a form of measure, a bar against which we could seek improvements. So there may be ways to intervene, uh, evolve uh, in ways that uh, lead to better outcomes. And if we invoke some of the discussion of, uh, of how we understand resilience in, in other settings around ecology and the environment in particular, but it, uh, sort of any manner of, of understanding resilience, there's this notion that it may, it may help us think through the process of how do we go about managing and addressing risks. Uh, because it sort of sets in motion a thought process uh, about layers of resilience or what contributes to resilience and how one goes about understanding and operating with that knowledge. So there, there are notions where resilience at, at its core, kind of the, maybe the most limited extent of resilience, and some, you know, there's this notion I'm kind of calling these of systems of different kinds, the most basic level of resilience that a, a system might exhibit is just the ability to respond. That when faced with a circumstance, an action occurs, probably better that's an appropriate action rather than an inappropriate action, and that's kind of the, the core form of resilience. Some systems go, systems of the second kind go further to the further extent of learning from that experience. So it's not that you know, the history is forgotten and every time you know, uh, it's just a reaction to what's immediately uh, there, that there's actual learning that can contribute to some sort of evolutionary adaptation. Systems of the third kind go further and deeper into monitoring that which relates to these vulnerabilities, the ability to monitor leading to the potential ability to detect which in turn might lead to the ability to intervene at an early stage, which might then augment or, or uh, improve uh, the ability to mitigate uh, the effects. The, the further step, and you know, obviously I, I, I uh, had the uh, foregrounding the fact that we work a lot on this sort of conflict early warning and forecasting, the systems of the fourth kind are trying to, to anticipate, to go further uh, beyond monitoring and working with that monitoring to go even further to anticipate, to forecast what might be coming down the road uh, and to do that in this sort of recursive way where you're kind of continually reflecting on what your circumstances are, looking ahead to what that implies for what you might face in the future and developing plans. So the, the essence of that, of, of all this, is trying to think through some of the challenges that are faced in development settings, in settings that are uh, subject to, prone to conflict, uh, and trying to think through what could be done, 
what's necessary to do things more effective, uh, effectively, and what are the processes behind that sort of thought process. If we flip this around, though, sort of more cynically, uh, you know, we face all the time, you know, many of us in, our, in, in, in all manner of fields that we work in, but no less in the development field, uh, and no less when you have uh, government actors involved, uh, especially no less when you have U.S. government actors involved, you know, is this really anything new that we haven't seen any before? Is this just, you know, a rebranding of fragility, trying to give kind of a more positive cloaking rather than characterizing societies in a, with a term that may come off fairly negatively, societies being fragile, well, we kind of flip that around and talk about more or less resilience. Uh, in some way, that's, that's better. Uh, that makes us feel more comfortable. It makes everyone that's sort of working in the domain more comfortable. So maybe it's not anything more uh, or better than what we know already. A second sort of cynical view is, well, you sort of can't avoid the fact, or maybe you can't avoid the fact that it, ascribing a lack of resilience is pejorative, and maybe it's unfairly pejorative. If you could simply remove some of these stresses and shocks, maybe these questions about resilience would be moot. So if you know, we're asking about societies or communities or individuals in conflict-affected settings and labeling them as lacking resilience, well, maybe it's not their fault. I mean, they don't want to be experiencing this stuff, and so the fact that they are exposed to that and suffer as a result of that and maybe don't fully recover from that, well, yeah, I mean, it, they don't want that. And some of the, the, the challenge is that, you know, resilience may ultimately require assistance. Maybe it's not just some sort of embedded intrinsic property that these different sorts of actors have. Uh, maybe you only get there with a certain foundation, uh, again, that's not necessarily intrinsic. So sort of criticizing or Im implying that there's some sort of weakness or failing, you know, we ought to all recognize that in the face of these circumstances, we probably would all need help uh, in order to, to make it through. There's also the concern that if we label certain things as being resilient or if we throw around the term of resilience, and this is where you know, the photo that Brandon used in the, in the, um, the announcement of the talk uh, comes into play, you know, maybe it's used too easily and too flippantly and in, in a ways that may be a bit calculated. Uh, yeah, maybe resilience is good but maybe not having to, you know, not needing resilience is actually better, right? Uh, maybe people get put into a situation where they exhibit resilience and that uh, sort of gets pawned off onto them. Maybe we should find ways to, you know, stop having people and societies and communities confronted with these sort of challenges to begin with and they wouldn't have to be exhibiting resilience. There's also this tendency, and I think this was really exemplified by the photo of, of kind of making that transition from resilience being a characteristic to them being an expectation that then in a sense becomes a burden. You know, once you label something as being resilient, it becomes that expectation that, that they will just soldier through. Uh, and maybe we should stop touting the strength of various communities and recognize uh, the actual harms and sufferings and, and vulnerabilities and, and need for, for assistance. Uh, rather than uh, just sort of uh, touting kind of how they managed to make it through. So as we turn to the, the, the dimension of, of how do you go about measuring resilience, this is where some of the challenges, the real challenges arise, and in a sense the rubber hits the road. So we can think about a number of different things that might go into that calculus. And maybe they go in in ways that are mutually exclusive. You know, you, you should only focus on one and not the other, the others. Uh, or maybe they should all go in at once in some way. And so there are questions about, well, what ought to go in there? So a number of the approaches and a number of the sort of conceptualizations focus on, sometimes heavily on, 
this sort of fundamental aspect about vulnerabilities. What sort of risks exist? What sort of hazards exist? What sort of susceptibility exists? And sometimes they just sort of leave it at that, right? Uh, and so it's sort of ignored what might ensue and the focus is really just on what sort of vulnerabilities might exist. The sort of the next or alternative layer is to focus on capabilities. So here most often people talk about structural and institutional capabilities around governance, uh, around civil society, around the economy. Uh, so there are features, uh, in particular in this development domain, features of societies and communities and in ways we can bring it all the way down to the individual level. And the notion is more of these things, sort of irrespective of what the threat or risk, uh, what the vulnerability is, more of those things in place will allow more of an ability to respond uh, to whatever might arise. But again, that's, it's sort of sometimes just left at that. Uh, and the question is, well, you know, sort of how do we know, right? That's a pretty strong assumption. We might all agree that there's an intuition to that, but how do we know that those effects are actually experienced? So the next layer that people often get into, uh, and sometimes people focus more predominantly on, are, well, what are the actual outcomes? What do we see? What do we observe? Uh, so let's not stop at or let's not be preoccupied with capabilities. Let's ask the question about outcomes. If you recall that chart that I drew out, well, not a lot of that was inherently about capabilities at the front end. It was about what's ensuing. And behind the scenes of that, maybe there, we want to know about what the capabilities are that might affect what that curve looks like. But maybe more fundamentally, we're concerned of what those outcomes look like. The further step beyond that is the notion of there are outcomes and then there's sort of deeper implications, sort of further effects beyond that. So you might experience dislocation as a result of a humanitarian disaster, but what further comes out of that? Does that have implications for economic development? Does that have implications for personal development? Do people develop anxiety disorders subsequent to that? Kind of what is the, what is the ensuing effect uh, from the sort of immediate outcome uh, that's being experienced? In practice, there's a lot of focus on vulnerabilities and capabilities uh, and not a whole lot of focus on outcomes. Uh, at least not necessarily in tandem. Some of that is because some of the vulnerabilities uh, and capabilities are often more measurable, uh, but it's, it's sort of curious that these things are kind of segmented in times when we're asking questions about measurement. So there's a sort of what would you measure, you know, what would you look at, and then there's the, the, the the question of, well, how would you look at it? What would you use that information? What would you do with that information? How would you process it? How would you make sense of it? You know, even if you knew that an outcome ensued, or even if you had a measure of institutional strength, okay, is, the, you know, is that the end? You know, or do you do something with it? Uh, so there are a number of different approaches that people have adopted, uh, and hopefully I won't, over the course of the remainder of this talk, uh, uh, bore or distract people too much with uh, things related to math, but one of the approaches is to say, well, there's some sort of algebraic function. If we have a number of those, you know, what I said were the, you know, things about the what, maybe in some way we bring those things together al algebraically, mathematically, uh, through some sort of computation that captures the extent of that especially if we're adopting what we think is a, a better, more holistic version that takes account of those several aspects of what. Resulting in some sort of index, perhaps, some sort of ultimate measure. And the, the, you know, part of the goal here might be that if you have multiple things, you're trying to condense them down to one thing that you can describe of as being resilience, rather than always being uh, sort of stuck with, I have you know, four or 10 different things what is resilience out of all that? 
Uh, there's a concern for, you know, especially as we think about kind of what that, that sort of stylized curve looks like, uh, a concern uh, for what rates of change might look like, and what is changing is the, is the rub, right? You know, what you would look at in particular. But here we're talking about forms of, of, of math that might involve things around sort of differential equations, differential functions, where you're, you're concerned with how things change not just with kind of repeated static measures of things. Another set of approaches focuses on typologies, saying, well, potentially we can distinguish different states of the world or possibly the trajectories between different states of the world. Um, and that certain individuals, certain communities may cluster in particular way under these different categories. So some people might exhibit sort of one state or one trajectory, uh, and that trajectory would be distinct enough from the trajectory that another set of individuals would exhibit. A further thing that people have talked about doing is saying, well, let's look at the, the network properties that, it, that exist, you know, especially as you think down to that individual and community level. What sort of relationships exist? What sort of ties exist? What happens across those ties? Is it about information? Is it about trust? What happens in the face of a shock? Does, do those ties get disrupted? Does the flow of information change? Uh, so thinking about sort of social network approaches to this. I'm going to show you uh, an approach that relies upon an algebraic function, not because I necessarily think that the others are off the table, but again, this is a foray uh, down the path, and, I, and there haven't, frankly, been uh, many forays down this path. So my priorities in setting out down this path is I want something that has a dimensionality to it. I don't think that resilience is just a thing out in nature that one can go out and take a measurement. I think it's multidimensional. Uh, I want it to be disaggregated in some form. I don't want it... Uh, so highly aggregated that I can't uh, uh, look at contrasts that ex might exist within a population or across a, a geographic space. And I want it to be something that is dynamic, that can change. So multiple aspects with some aspect of granularity and the resolution to it uh, and something that changes over time. So the way that, that we've been approaching this is to say, well, we can take a number of different input indicators to achieve that dimensionality. We can calculate it at the level of a grid cell month. And I'll tell you or show you in a moment what I mean uh, in particular by a grid cell. Uh, and we can do it in a manner that updates monthly, or at least you know, aspects of it update monthly. Uh, inevitably, one uh, tends to be limited by data in terms of how uh, much dynamic, uh, uh, how dynamic the properties can be. So we're focusing here on resilience to conflict. So our dimensionality, our measurements, our, our approach to this uh, is taking account of, you know, what's inherent to conflict, what's inherent to the way that people study and measure conflict. So if we take that curve that I had before and translate it to this domain of conflict, the vulnerability here becomes the question about a vulnerability of conflict. Whether or not there's onset of conflict, and I'll talk more about what I mean or how we measure conflict. Vulnerability, susceptibility, risk to conflict. Whether it's a new onset of conflict or ongoing conflict. There's the question of whether or not conflict actually happens. Merely because you have a risk doesn't mean that the risk uh, materializes in the event or, or, or the circumstance. There's the question about the escalation of conflict. So let's not just stop at whether or not conflict occurs, but let's start to describe the nature of that conflict. So escalation is about how bad does it get, how fast? Kind of where does it go? What does that trajectory look like? We're partly uh, concerned as well, or we, 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 I think we ought to be concerned about, well, just how bad does that conflict get? So some conflicts may get really bad, but it takes a long time for them to get to that point. Other conflicts may get fairly bad fairly quickly, but never reach the level uh, of another type of conflict. 
How long does the conflict actually last? How long are you seeing violence? Does that conflict ever terminate? Does it ever return to the point where we're not seeing violence anymore? Subsequent to observing conflict, can we say anything about whether or not the vulnerability stays the same as it was before all along, or does that vulnerability diminish at all? And then I, I mentioned earlier this notion of recurrence. Do you have uh, conflict occurring once more? So this is what we're seeking then effectively to map. And you can think about, you know, these are the essentially eight different indicators that I was talking about. You can think about half a dozen of those having a ne negative connotation vis-a-vis -vis resilience, right? If you're highly vulnerable, uh, if you experience conflict, if that conflict escalates quickly, if, it's, if it gets really bad, uh, if it lasts a long time, and if it recurs, those would suggest uh, a lack of resilience or a lower level of resilience to conflict. Whereas the reduction in vulnerability following conflict and the fact that conflict even terminates at all uh, is positive in terms of our, our conception of resilience. So for vulnerability, what we're ultimately doing here in terms of our measure is, is we're developing this sort of baseline susceptibility to conflict, whether it's ongoing or uh, sort of uh, ensuing uh, an onset of conflict. And here we're defining conflict, and not because you couldn't define it in other potential ways, and other potential ways are on the table, certainly, given the data uh, and given how we understand conflict uh, as a broad term. But here we're defining it as events resulting in fatalities involving organized armed actors involved in state-based contention over government and or territory. So this is borrowing from the way uh, that folks at the uh, at Uppsala University that are one of the, uh, the main sources of tracking armed conflict define conflict. One could include, though, uh, other manners of conflict that include things all the way down to riots and disturbances, other uh, forms of conflict that are nonviolent, or other forms that are of conflict that are violent but don't rise to the level of armed conflict. So we actually develop a predictive model for this at the level of a grid cell uh, on a monthly basis, where we're using characteristics of that grid cell, including the, the recent history of that grid cell, whether it experienced conflict before, but then also characteristics about population. I'll mention nighttime lights in a moment. Uh, and then features about the geography, uh, things related to where the grid cell is located within a country and relative to the capital. We're able to, to predict with uh, close to 90% reliability whether a grid cell will experience a, a conflict event involving killings at a monthly level based upon this model. So to start out with, we have a, a pretty decent model of vulnerability. But again, we're not stopping there. That is just one attribute that would feed into our measure of resilience. So let me just take a, a quick foray, uh, and hopefully I won't go on too long here with this talk, but why is granularity so significant? And I want to talk about this quickly and then talk a little bit about uh, some of the conflict data and then talk about what a grid cell is just so that you're uh, on board with understanding uh, where that comes from. So part of the backdrop for this is this is the sort of work that we do for USCID, where we ultimately produce these uh, uh, instability risk forecasts. This one is the risk of internal war over a three-year period. So a relatively long time frame in the future using data, in this case, from 2014. And we're predicting it for countries. So not highly granular, either geographically or temporally. All that we can tell you with this forecast, and we can do it with a 95% reliability that countries in red have a very high risk of, of experiencing internal war three, within a three-year window, but just whether or not that country would. We don't know where in the country. We don't know when in this time period. It's relatively crude, highly reliable, but crude. We want to do better. Uh, those that work in conflict early warning want to be able to get more precise than that, both, both spatially and temporally. So a quick uh, note on, on the conflict event data. 
There are several different sources uh, that many of us work with. And on another project, we've been actually working to integrate those sources. Uh, the, one of the biggest developments over the last handful of years here is a number of different initiatives that have developed conflict event data, so specific incidents, and where they've geocoded the location of those incidents. And I know uh, the work that uh, INCOR and, and others here on Northern Ireland have done, there's very good data on sometimes on specific countries, uh, specific localities. Uh, these data happen to span many countries, initially starting with Africa, and a number of them has been uh, actually extending to the, the entirety of the world. So you have four different data sets here. The ones in orange, uh, that's a data set called ACLED that spans from armed conflict events down to things like riots and protests. Uh, the one in green, uh, which I'll be focusing on in the analysis that I talk about here, the one in green focuses strictly upon armed conflict events of that character that I talked about before. Uh, the dots in red are terrorism events with some attendant questions about the extent to which terrorism is a distinct phenomenon from armed conflict. And that was part of the purpose of us working on integrating these data sets. Uh, and then the ones in purple is from a data set that focuses entirely upon non-armed conflict. Uh, so there are a number of different sources, and I just showed you here a little bit of the data that exists uh, for Nigeria in 2011. So the upshot of this is we have various different sources of data that we can make use of that are fairly granular in terms of being able to specify where conflicts events are happening and the types of those events and what is happening in those events, uh, things like casualties. So a second indicator that goes into this resilience measure is simply whether or not at a given month that grid cell is experiencing a conflict event. And again, an event that results in a killing. So there's this vulnerability and then there's this conflict exposure. We want to also know, sort of looking out into the future of, well, how exactly, how long exactly does that conflict last? Uh, is this just sort of a, you know, a one-off incident? Is this a relatively uh, short spasm of, of violence that occurs? Or is this something that's lasting? We want to know escalation. So the rate at which uh, the conflict progresses to its peak from the, the, the current point. So what is the maximum number of killings that are experienced at some future point of continuous conflict? Uh, what was the, the level of killings initially? Kind of how, how steep is that curve of killings? How severe, looking out within the next year, how severe at any point did the conflict get in terms of number of killings? Did, within this 12-month window, uh, subsequent to um, uh, uh, the conflict, were there, were there any three uh, consecutive months where there was no killing? So we, we limit the extent to which we consider termination just on the basis that a given month exhibits nothing. Sometimes that can just be a fleeting moment, a momentary ceasefire, what have you. Uh, and so people have typically tried to use sort of multiple time periods as an indication of whether or not uh, termination or a, a peace is, is at all lasting. Uh, and then we're asking a sort of a similar question about, uh, with a sort of similar form about the recurrence of conflict. After you've had these sort of three months of, of no killings, is there a, a repeat of violence subsequent to that within a 12-month period? And then the final thing that we do, and I'll have to uh, talk through in a moment where, where it derives from, is to include a measure of the impact of conflict. Uh, and here we're making use of, of a new satellite-based measure. People have been using it the last several years uh, of nighttime lights, basically satellite photos that are taken uh, around the world. I uh, think they're not necessarily on a daily basis, at least the ones that are uh, publicly available. Uh, but people have used that as an indicator and actually ground truthed it uh, as a relatively reliable indicator of economic activity, uh, population movements. Uh, so it's a basically, a, we're using it as a gauge of the extent to which an area uh, seems to be affected in terms of commerce and simply people residing there. Are people being forced out? Uh, is, is commercial activity dying as a result of, of the conflict? People have used this actually for some really neat analysis uh, in places like Syria to really document uh, where populations are moving and, unfortunately, the, the very severe decimation of infrastructure. 
So what's a grid cell? I've been teasing about, the, about grid cells. Grid cells are just a way of taking the globe and dividing it into sort of equal size pixels, as it were. If you think about the, you know, pixels on a TV, just a little unit uh, with the same dimensions as you go around the world. Uh, the typical grid cells that people work with are basically 50 square kilometers. Uh, so this is a pretty decent level of resolution, but we're not talking about down to the level, you know, resolution of a city block or a building. It would be an area that might span a city and its environs, or maybe even broader than that. So here happens to be uh, a data on the estimated uh, population around the world reduced down to grid cells. Uh, you can similarly do that with the nighttime lights data to show where there's the concentration of, of nighttime lights. So we're making use of data that's projected down to this level of a grid cell because we want to get down to a finer level re of resolution in a country and we're fortunate enough to have a decent amount of data that's actually rendered at that level. So just to give you uh, some quick um, results that come out of this or a sense of some of the, you know, as, as you look at some illustrative cases uh, of how these indicators look. Uh, so I just happened to pull out three of the main cities uh, in Nigeria. So Abuja, Lagos, and Maiduguri, uh, I'll be showing you in a moment. So this is show, it's just showing a sense of these different indicators. Uh, and part of the upshot of this, part of the takeaway that I want to leave you with is, as you look through these, you'll see that the, the, the individual indicators within a given case don't necessarily line up. So this is not a, a case of kind of everything goes in hand in hand. If you're just adding more indicators, you're not actually adding any more information. Here you have things that are not necessarily always synchronized. You know, not every conflict event gets serious or escalates fast. Not every uh, uh, conflict event has the same sort of implied economic effects. Uh, so you see things that are not fully synchronized. Uh, and then as you look across different cases, you can see that there actually are different patterns that are occurring in different places in, within a country. So the important thing here is to, again, we're turning back, we're calling back to that map that I showed at a country level, Countries are not homogenous, right? They're not all experiencing the same things at the same time. They're experiencing different effects of conflict or sometimes even a lack of conflict uh, at different points in time. And as we walk through the different cases, uh, you see those sorts of contrasts. So when we ultimately pull this all together, start to pull this all together, I just want to sort of walk you through three of the maps uh, and show you kind of how they tell different stories and why mapping resilience uh, tells uh, potentially a richer story than you would get if you just focused on one of the indicators, which is part of the upshot of this. So if you just, talk, uh, if you just looked at conflict exposure, this happens to be the data for January of 2009 in Nigeria. And the blue squares there are grid cells, so particular... 50 kilometer square spots within Nigeria that had conflict events armed conflict, by armed conflict actors that resulted in killings. Sometimes killing between the forces, uh, sometimes killings of civilians. So you see there are, you know, I think that's five different grid cells that had any sort of conflict events as we define them within this uh, particular time frame of January 2009. If you flip it over though and look at our model of you know, the, the results of our estimations, our predictions of conflict vulnerability, you see, well, some of those spots that in fact exhibited conflict uh, for that month were in fact places that we would have uh, felt to be prone to that sort of conflict. So it perhaps comes as no surprise. But then as you scan around the country, you might say, well, well actually there are other spots. Uh, you know, for example, my degree, uh, didn't experience a conflict event in that month, but in terms of this uh, vulnerability prediction, it was seen as being highly prone to that sort of conflict. And you know, in the ensuing years in the northeast of Nigeria, with the, the rise of Boko Haram, that in fact is one of the hot spots for conflict. Uh, so you get a slightly different story if you look at the map in terms of vulnerability as opposed to just uh, straight exposure. 
And then if you flip over to uh, this multi-dimensional measure, you know, integrating different indicators uh, of resilience, you see a richer map where there's, there's sort of much more of a mosaic, um, which mirrors some of the mosaic of, of the vulnerability estimation, uh, but a, a mosaic nonetheless uh, that looking at resilience. So let me just then flip over and kind of sh uh, show you these in tandem quickly. And so this is an actual time-lapse animation of how this, well, this gets calculated over time, month by month, uh, showing how the map of Nigeria evolves for these different measures. Now, some of what you'll notice is that the resilience index, because certain of the data that we use don't change on a month-to-month -month basis, we don't have it at that fine grain of level, some of the background conditions that feed into the resilience index are essentially static. Uh, and some of what's, being, uh, what's happening is being driven principally by the conflict activity that's occurring uh, and how that influences conflict vulnerability. Uh, point being that we can show how there are dynamic features to the landscape uh, and we can actually map those out. And in principle, if we had better data for some of these indicators that were more fine-grained temporally, we'd see a map of the resilience index and potentially the conflict vulnerability index that was changing, that was morphing uh, much more rapidly and much more substantially. So let me just uh, conclude with a few reflections and uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, I've, I've taken longer than I had intended to, but I wanted to be sure to, to walk you through, through things and uh, some of my thoughts were forming as I, I was developing this since this is all, as I said, fresh off the, uh, the press as it were. So this for us, as, as far as we can tell, is, is one of the few and, and maybe the first uh, measures of resilience to conflict, especially one that seeks to go down the path this way, analytically through an actual, you know, operationalized measurement and not just talking about the concept uh, in prose. We've approached it in a way where, where we're taking multiple, multiple dimensions and one of the critical things for those that are uh, in conflict studies, you know, especially uh, many of us, in, in, uh, I'm a political scientist, many of my uh, colleagues in political science that study conflict, people typically study each of those different indicators separately, as though the rest of them just don't exist, right? Ignoring the fact that there's uh, some natural interlinking among those different uh, phenomena, uh, those different measures. So what we're doing here is both novel in the sense we're trying to measure resilience, but we're also doing it because we think it's a contribution that uh, advances beyond some of the ways that people have segmented the study uh, of conflict. The way that we approach it encompasses these dimensions of vulnerability and exposure. Uh, there are aspects that relate to capabilities that are embedded within the vulnerability measure, and then we're ultimately including at least a measure of impact uh, crude that it, though it may be. And at least for now, uh, as, as sort of in this initial four way, we, we've achieved that priority we had of, of getting more granular, both spatially and temporally, um, than a lot of the analyses that exist out there uh, about conflict, uh, or at least conflict vulnerability. Because this is our first foray with it, we still need to and want to experiment more with the indicators and how we specify them, look for ways that we might be able to bring in different or better data. Uh, we still think we can do better with the, the model of vulnerability, even though we have a reasonably high reliability in terms of our predictions. So what's missing from all this? Uh, well, I think one thing that's missing, and it may be uh, for many of you in this room, um, for those of us that do a lot of micro level, community level, individual level research, what's missing in a sense in this story, what's missing in the, in the measurement, uh, is things that would really go down to that community or individual level, right? That would bring that on board. The challenge for this sort of exercise and some of the purposes that we would use it for is, well, do we actually have the sort of data that would be necessary to bring that dimension in? Now, there are possibilities. Some of the 
sort of barometer survey data that exists that span a number of countries from which one might be able to derive some individually based indicators of trust in government or other sorts of things could potentially be uh, another input into this. I guess the other response would be, well, are those layers, are those uh, uh, layers of analysis, are they necessary to this purpose? Uh, I would have to think more about that and I, I, I welcome your thoughts about whether they are or ought to be necessary to this uh, exercise. Uh, and then I think a final um, one or two points. Can this actually be validated? Or what would that actually mean? What would that entail? So I, I, I will own up to the fact that you know, those who do quantitative work, those who work with data, you can put any sort of data into a machine and come out with a number or set of numbers, right? Uh, you can combine anything uh, you know, however you might want. The question of, yeah. is whether or not, you know, does it actually mean something? Does it mean what you think it means, what you intended it to capture? Now, I think some of that is potentially addressed by you take very seriously, you work very consciously to think about what you are trying to measure, uh, the components of it or how you go about measuring it. You try and bring in the sort of data that would, in fact, measure those things. Uh, and you work with it in a, in a way that um, you know, makes sense, that's, that's rigorous analytically. So maybe there's some sort of conceptual and facial validity to the way we've gone about doing it. Some of it, though, ultimately might rely upon having to say, well, we, we have to ground truth this in some way. We have to compare it to what we know on the ground, whether that's through field research or looking deep at cases in terms of whether they track with what we know or what people uh, that are very expert about particular localities know. The other thing about validity is, does this in any way relate analytically to things that we would expect to be observable implications? If resilience means anything, it means anything, it means something because of potentially how it could be applied. It may not mean anything just on the face of it. Uh, so the closing thought is, is on applications then. So we intend to, to use some version, some refined version of this uh, in analytical studies that we're doing. Uh, particularly, as I noted, part of the, the genesis of this was being interested in how is resilience influenced by development aid or whether it is even is influenced by development aid. It's also interesting to potentially explore what might correlate with resilience, what helps to explain resilience, or in what conditions, what context do you see more or less resilience. If you, if you take it as given or you, you accept that the, res, the measure itself is good, what seems to drive it? Practically, and again, referencing the work we do with USAID uh, and others, the utility of this is if you have a sense of what the resilience map looks like and how it evolves and how you might be able to project it forward into the future, it might help in identifying places that are hot spots or places that are subject to vulnerabilities that uh, are, are especially pronounced. And in response to that, being able to target actions, target improvements. Uh, if, if resilience is ultimately a function of conditions, circumstances, individuals, institutions on the ground that are contributing to what is observed, in principle, uh, all of those things are subject to, to influence uh, and in turn resilience would be as well. So I'll close it at that and thanks again for your uh, generous patience in uh, staying around, sticking it out uh, in the steam here. <laughs> <laughs>